Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. March is upon us and we like to celebrate Women's History Month where we showcase women through history and even up currently today who are living their dreams and making inspiration and magic happen for people around the world. On the program today, we're blessed with Jennifer Batten. Maybe some of you may not know who she is, but if you were back in the late part of the 1980s, you would know who the King of Pop was, and she was the lead guitarist as she toured with Michael Jackson during his Bad Album and Dangerous Tours. I remember the first time I seen Jennifer was when I was watching Michael Jackson's Moonwalk, and I thought, a woman playing an electric guitar? Boy, she's shredding it just as bad as any of the hair bands back in the 1980s. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Jennifer Batten. Jennifer, thank you for being on the program today. Oh, thanks for having me. How are you? You know, it's kind of fun when you follow your dreams and you find that when time converges in the right moment, you're doing your thing, you could just never believe some of the miraculous things that could happen for you. Has that pretty much been kind of your your life that way? Yeah, indeed. I've had some amazing things happen. and I think it's just putting energy out into the universe and things magnetized and come back to you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, it was interesting. I was thinking about, uh, you know, what I would talk to you about, your influences, things like that. And one of them, you know, I was kind of rolling around thinking, okay, now, how did you first get started? You know, when did you know that was your path? And, and I thought to myself, and it was sort of like an inside joke, that, well, you were watching an episode of The Monkees. And then I kind of looked at your biography and realized that was actually one of your influences. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I was a big fan of their show. That was, that was always very fun. Um, but I started playing when I was eight years old, uh, motivated mainly by the Beatles taking over our town, a little town in upstate New York. And between that and a jealousy that my sister had a guitar and I didn't, that was motivation enough to, to get me started and started taking lessons. But when I was 12, I announced to my mother that I wanted to do that for a career. And the only reason I remember that is because her response was, well, honey, you know, that's a very competitive business. And uh, I felt the emotion of the warning, but when you're 12, it's, it doesn't make any sense. Like, so what? That's what I want to do. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's funny how you have enough people out there say, oh, that's a wonderful dream, and then they want you stepping into that direction and putting the work in, and sometimes the disappointments, well, many times the disappointments that can come along with, I suppose, the expectations that you have. And then they try to discourage you. Oh, you know, you might want to go do something else, you know, that sort of a thing. Yeah, there are so many people that just don't make it in this business, and they feel that they're saving you from heartbreak, but as we've talked about on this show many times, it isn't so much that. It breaks your heart if you don't follow it to to see where it takes you, you know, how you develop and how you begin to master your craft. Is that pretty much how it was for you? Yeah, you know, I, I remember a quote from Eddie Murphy, of all people, that said, if you have something to fall back on, you will. So I, I think it's important to go out on a limb and you know, jump and a net will appear. That's, that's the attitude that you need to put into it anyway. And, of course, there's, there's going to be all kinds of challenges and stumbles and disappointments. But that's, that's part of the game. Absolutely. Now, as you got started, as you began playing guitar, what was coming into your mind what you felt your goal was? Was it just to get out there and think, you know, one of these days I'm going to play in a band, I'm going to make a record? Just what was on your mind as you got started? Well, uh, since starting when I was eight, it was just having the guitar in my hands, and I, I don't think I felt much further than my weekly lessons and learning how to read. Um, and in my teen years, I really... I started to improvise and I started to get into blues and I would spend my entire allowance on blues records and jam along in my room and uh, put the needle back and forth to try to learn the solos. And it, it was just a very natural evolution through my teen years. I, I got more and more serious and then eventually signed up for what is now called Musicians Institute. At that time it was only guitar. It was called... Guitar Institute of Technology that was in Hollywood and started by a guy named Pat Hicks and jazz guitarist Howard Roberts. So that that's what really launched me into a very, very serious direction. So that, that was a tough school, boy. I, in fact, I, I think I was the only student, I was the only female out of 60 guys, and I think the only student that had never played a gig before. 
So I, I had my work cut out for me. Well, certainly playing gigs is even more work. You know, a lot of people look at the end result of being on stage and performing and think, that's what I want to do. And then they get into the entertainment business, whatever direction they come from in that, they realize, you know, damn, this is actually work. <laughs> oh, yeah. Especially for you right. because you were playing in, you know, what was it, like 10 or 15 different bands in the L.A. area from what I understand and, and you know, maybe twice a month and you were packing your gear, you were in places that you couldn't park. Yeah, you know, those typical things. I have a friend who owns a jazz club and, and you watch these musicians each night that come in you know, they're packing their own stuff. They're actually in the seediest part of town. Where, you know, and you think to yourself, boy, you really are committed to this. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you didn't get the payoff of the, the joy of playing, nobody would put up with what we do. You know, I mean, the local gigs, just finding parking and loading your gear and dealing what will later become the, the damage that chiropractors and massage therapists take care of uh, to, to constantly going through a metal detector and all the ah it, it it's not so joyous the travel part of it and the setting up the well not only that but also working with other people in the band that can be pretty difficult too because of the cliche of you know all the party and they do whether they're going to show up sober or ready to go i remember i was watching a documentary on the eagles and glenn fry said there was a point uh after they had replaced i believe it was don felder and uh, he was saying, you know, we finally had made a decision that when we came in to rehearse and produce music, there would be no drinking and using anything like that. He says, the most amazing thing happened, we actually were better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you're clear-headed and focused, it's amazing what can happen. I, I've been very lucky in my career. I've never had to deal with that, not with any of the bands I've been with. So, uh, I kind of avoided that whole nasty mess. Now, I think what's exciting about your particular career is the fact that you were a woman during the 1980s when it was just infested with male hair bands. You know, everybody <laughs> was pointing to the fact, you know, uh, here's the greatest guitarist on planet Earth. I'm like, yeah, those guys are okay, but, you know, they're kind of, to me, they seem kind of similar in many ways. And, and here was, a, like I was saying at the beginning of the show, the first time I had seen you is I was actually out at my parents uh, to visit with them, but everybody seemed to be gone at the time, and I noticed this videotape, and it was Michael Jackson Moonwalker, and I thought, oh, well, what's this all about? Because I grew up, you know, as a fan of Michael Jackson's back in the 1970s when you'd see him on, for instance, the variety uh, music shows that were on at the time. Sure. And so I popped this in, and I thought, wow, this guy came a long way. Because to me, in my imagination, I was still remembering Michael Jackson, little kid with the Jackson 5. Mm. And then, of course, he moved on by the time I was in the early stages of high school with his album Off the Wall. But I'd never really seen him perform. And so I popped this tape, and I'm like, holy mother of goodness, I don't <laughs> remember this kid turning into this. And then there you were, and I'm like, what? Look at this woman. She's on stage playing lead guitar. And I was thinking... You're just as badass as any of the hair band guys were going on, and it just it really caught me and stayed with me from that point on. Plus, all the guys were stealing our hairdos. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Moonwalker was really, really great fun. We we shot that uh, come together for two days, and oh my god! After every take, Michael would have it turned louder and louder. And when I thought it was absolutely skull crushing between takes, he turned to me and said. Do you think it's loud enough? Uh, <laughs> Are you out of your mind? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Crazy. You know, I kind of wonder, too, when you think of, for instance, uh, in the NBA when Michael Jordan was playing, is that you would hear a lot of times players from other teams say, you know, the reason he's making, you know, scoring on us seemingly so easy is because you can't help but find yourself standing there watching him and forgetting what you're doing on the court in the first place. <laughs> Did you ever find yourself that way when you were performing with Michael Jackson during the tours that you were on? You know, the most stunning time of, of the, gosh, two, two and a half hour show was during Billy Jean. Uh, at the end, he would improvise a dance, and it was just him and drums. So that's when I could, you know, go to the enjoyment of it and not worry about the left brain, about my parts and what I'm doing and where I'm supposed to be on the stage. So that that was the best seat in the house to see that every single night was just really beautiful and inspiring. And then in 1993, you were in a performance that you probably never could have imagined you would be in when you did the <laughs> halftime performance at the 1993 Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, that that was one of the most 
fun memories in, in part because I knew how huge it was. And honestly, it's the only time in 10 years of being with Michael that I ever thought that he seemed nervous because the amount of pressure is just enormous. It's live. If if there's any screw-ups, there's nothing you can do about it. It's going to be out in the universe forever. And, uh, you know, I I knew it was going to happen once. That was it. And so to me, it was really joyous. It wasn't my name on the marquee. I was just having fun. And uh, there was a lot of things that happened on that day that, I didn't even know what was going to happen. Like, there, there was uh, impersonators that <clears throat> twirled out of smoke on the scoreboards. Uh, that was new for me, man. If you go back and look at the, the tape, you can see me in the background looking off to the side, thinking, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> and all this the, place the burning to the ground? Are we rocking it that hard? What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, that was a, a really fun thing to do. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm kind of curious, this was a question I had been thinking about, uh, and it comes to desire, and, you know, each of us have a desire that comes to us that I think really lights up something inside of us, our souls, and in your case, Uh it was because your sister had a guitar, you thought, you know, I want to do this, and then in time, you started committing yourself to the work. Now, I think in the beginning of desire, and and I'm seeing this a lot with shows such as, you know, like American Idol or The Voice of people who I believe they have a desire, but they want to get in and sing. Certainly they want a career uh, doing this. But in that desire, I think, in the beginning comes that immature expectation of the results. Sure. And I wonder, but, you know, in time, that desire, when you start maturing into it, you realize, wait a minute, it's much more than this. It's about me becoming the best or mastering what I was given as that desire to be. What did you feel that happened for you when you felt that transition where you said, you know, this ain't about fame and fortune and getting out there and doing that, but it's really about me seeing how good can I actually get with this? Uh, that realization came in small chunks throughout the years and maybe full force not all that long ago. Um, I think maybe when the, the record companies went to hell and everybody's got access to steal everybody's music, and you just realize that that the past that was common in the 80s where bands or or individuals would uh, do their thing and do demo tapes and hope for a record deal and hope that the record company would promote you and put you out there. and There is a fantasy that you think is going to happen because what's in your face are the the top 1%, you know, the Fleetwood Macs of the world, or in my case, the Joe Satriani and Steve Vai's doing instrumental music. You, you just have this something in your imagination of what that life is about. And in the end, you know, it's it's just different for every single person on the planet. And I've often, I, I've given thousands of guitar clinics and many, many times I've had people ask, you know, how do you quote unquote make it? How do you get there? Right. And th- there's no single way, all you can do is, number one, make sure that your priorities are straight, and number one should be your love of music and the time that you put into it. And I think that energy goes out into the universe and brings back whatever it's going to bring back. And you you can't force anything to happen. You can put out your resume to a bazillion different people. and You know, it's the same in all creative arts, whether it's writing a book or playing music or sculpting or whatever. You can put the energy out there, and it's just going to do what it's going to do. But ultimately, what you're left with is your skills and your enjoyment of what you're doing. That that has to be number one, and everything else is icing on the cake. Totally agree there. I remember reading a biography on the late Freddie Mercury, the front man for Queen, and it was stating in there, uh, it was said that Freddie Mercury, when success came, he was ready for it. And I really kind of meditated on that for a while, especially when it comes to, you know, the arena that we're in, which is entertainment, is that you really have to prepare yourself because when success, if and when it does come, that timing, that convergence is just right, your ass had better be prepared for it or it's going to fleet right by and you're going to wonder, how did that train hit me and go by? Mm-hmm. And certainly when it came to that opportunity you had to audition for Michael Jackson, 
tell us about that story because I think you wanted to make sure you were the best that you could be when your time was to be there to do this. Yeah. Um, Josh, when I got the call that he was auditioning and I, I could get in there and audition, I took two or three days off and just learned his music and just spent all day, all night working on his stuff. And prior to that, I was in five different bands. And in all of them, it was a very common thing in the 80s, especially due to Van Halen's popularity, of to for the guitar player to have a solo section where you play something by yourself. So I was very comfortable doing that. And as it turns out, when I went into the audition, there was no band. It was just me and a video camera, and Michael would look at the tapes later and and uh, choose somebody. And so the, the only guidance I was given was to play something funky because, you know, 90% of my gig, regardless of playing the Beat It solo, was, was support, playing funky parts. And so I improvised something, then I started doing some random uh, soloing improv. Uh, I played... I, I had finished uh, a four-song demo prior to that with Michael Sambello that was going to be shopped to try to get that elusive record deal before the Jackson thing came along. And one of the things was I, I worked at a, a solo for J- uh, John Coltrane's Giant Steps. That was a two-hand tapping technique kind of thing. And from a cover band I had been in, we played Beat It for a couple of years. So I already knew Eddie Van Halen's solo in that. So I finished the audition with that, thinking he, he might find that useful. <laughs> there you go. It's funny how Eddie Van Halen even popped into my mind when I was thinking about this interview, too. You know, I was wonder if she'd love to be on stage just doing a little guitar battle against him. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's such an innovator. Uh, just a very, very unique style. And, and in songwriting, too, not just his soloing improv. So a, a couple of days later, I heard that Michael was interested in as a matter of coming down, playing with the band, and see how it goes. And Honestly, nobody ever told me I had the gig. It was just week after week. Nobody was sending me home. So uh, the the first month was a band in one room by ourselves, um, dancers in another and singers in another, essentially getting down the stuff, the live stuff that had been the victory tour that Michael did with his brothers, and then adding also a few of the songs on Bad that had been released. Because he didn't want to play anything that hadn't been on the radio. And the second month was in a giant soundstage with Michael and everybody together and the special effects and the pyro and lasers and everything. And before I knew it, I had a passport and a ticket to Tokyo. And I thought, well, it's looking good. Mm -hmm. And when we were in Tokyo, Michael shut down the Tokyo Disneyland so we could hang out for a couple hours without the public. And at one point, Sheryl Crow was one of the background singers and she and I were in one of the the gift shops, and I was looking at this goofy, uh, <laughs> funny, I would say goofy, it's all from Disney, a Daffy, Daffy Duck toothbrush holder, where you, <laughs> you push down on the head, and the eyes go back and forth for as long as you're supposed to brush your teeth, and we were just both fascinated by this thing, and Michael snuck up behind me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, I love how you're playing the Beat It solo, and I thought, yeah, job security, <laughs> Uh, I was with him for 10 years on his solo tour. There you go. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, when you talk about how Michael Jackson shut down Disneyland, that's kind of the Elvis Presley effect. Absolutely. And, you know, and it was funny because I was just talking with uh, the, it was uh, uh, Aldrin, which was his fiance up until the point uh, just, you know, he, he died. They were dating for nine months and, and about to be Ginger Aldrin. That's who I was trying to think of there for a minute. And yeah. she talked about how he would do that or open up jewelry stores in the middle of the night, you know, those kinds of things. And and it's funny, you know, how parallel that is because you actually kind of started out with an Elvis impersonator. So I guess you got the Elvis Midas touch starting then, and then Michael Jackson just carried it into to reality. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty odd, isn't it? Yeah, that was my first tour outside of America was with an Elvis impersonator in, of all places, American Samoa, which is an island about 25 miles long. And the, the contact there was the Elvis impersonator's brother was a missionary on the islands. But I really got the bug for, for travel from that because it was so different and so exotic. I, I just loved it. You know, and the advantage, too, with uh, the King of Pop was the fact that you would probably 
perform maybe, what, a couple of days a week. So you had a lot of time in your travel to actually get out there and explore the world and enjoy it, it sounded like. Absolutely. It was so luxurious. And I made a pile of money and was able to buy a house, which, you know, when you make a living as a guitar player, most guitar players can't ever do that. So it was it was a real blessing on many, many levels. But, yeah, we played two or three days a week. Um, most tours, it's it's so expensive to keep a band on the road, and especially his entourage was 100 people just paying us. And the hotel fees alone at that time was a half a million dollars a week. And, uh, you know, Michael had the luxury at that time of not having to play every night. And so as a result, we really got a chance to see every country and every city we were in. Exciting stuff. Now, when you were out there and you were performing, I I really enjoy asking this of entertainers. Uh, I like to talk about that force of the soul expressing itself. And to me, that moment happens when I'll be, let's say, doing an interview with you, for instance, where something comes through and you feel like you've disappeared, but something is working through you. Sure. You've had those experiences, I'm sure. Oh, God, yeah. And that that's the best. When you just lose yourself into what you're doing, it's, uh, that is the ultimate state of humanity, I think. And I think we all try to get there through whatever means we can. And uh, fortunately for me, it, it happens pretty often. Um, yeah, and it happens at home as well when I'm writing or doing sessions. And that's, that's just big fun. Sometimes it can even be washing dishes. Hey, man, I lost myself sure. and they're done. What just happened there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that state. Now, you've also uh, played with the likes of Jeff Beck, considered one of the great guitarists of all time, and and now you're doing things solo now with quite a discography, as I can see here. Uh, Are you still, uh, from time to time, uh, inspiring or teaching others to do the same? I mean, you came from a time, again, as I was saying, it was mostly a male-dominated arena, and the music business or the entertainment business in general, as you were saying, is hard enough as it is just to break it and maybe hopefully get paid, let alone make a living, as you were talking yeah. about. And then being a female during that time, I'm sure, just was even more challenging, wasn't it? Yeah, there, there were a lot of challenges and a lot of prejudice, and there still is. But I'll tell you what, it's it's not really different now, um, I think, in part due to the Internet. And when Michael Jackson chose me for the band, Prince had already gotten Wendy and Lisa. So I, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing that it was inspired by that. But just by being out there, um, I've gotten tons of letters from girls that say, you're the reason I started guitar because I saw you on stage, or especially since the Internet. I I thought back in 1987 when I joined him that the female revolution was happening. Uh, And then basically 30 years went by and nothing until maybe five years ago. And now there's there's a bunch of young women that are just, kicking butt, and I don't think there's a month that goes by that I don't get turned on to some video from a little goddess from Thailand that's 10 years old doing Paganini, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's it's a long way from being balanced, but it's a hell of a lot better than it was. And, in fact, now I, I see people are looking for females because it's, it's kind of a popular thing now, whereas back in the early 80s, especially, it was like, oh, God, that's the last thing you want in the band. It's just it's an aggressive rock band. Because mm-hmm. back then it was thought of more as women or females being more of the band roadies kind of a thing rather than the people that can actually be innovative and creative and on stage, as you said, just tearing it up. Well, you know, it's it's guitar, and especially rock guitar, is a, thought of as a, a different kind of world. Uh, there's always been plenty of singer-songwriters that, that play guitar to varying degrees and sing and write lyrics, but as far as being a soloist and playing aggressively, that's that's still a, a gap that's very unbalanced. Very good stuff. And I understand that you have been conducting workshops around the world, mostly in Europe, things like that. Um, are you still continuing to do that? Yeah, I do. I do a little bit of everything, and I, I do love variety. If I just did one thing, I would get bored. But uh, it just keeps me fired up to, to be doing different things, different sorts of things. I do... Uh, demos in guitar shops for different products. I do clinics and colleges. I have a 
solo multimedia show that I've been doing for 10 years that I I play alone in sync with films that I cut together. And I, I get a lot of joy out of doing that. Plus, it's a very easy thing to book rather than trying to get half a dozen people together for band gigs or very expensive touring. So I it, continue to evolve that. And in fact, when I do my guitar workshops now, I, I usually do it in sync with the same films and uh, just break down what I'm doing between songs instead of telling stories about the songs for for entertainment kind of thing. Well, Jennifer, I want to let you know that it's been a real pleasure, you know, as I was saying, you get out there and you're doing your thing. It doesn't matter, you know, how it turns out. It's that you're doing it, you're mastering it, and as you said, you're putting it out there and the universe starts ripple effecting back, and you never know when that timing happens. But, you know, uh, my son, he had watched the Moonwalker tape, and this was a, probably about two, three years after that, and so he was about three years old. And I'll tell you, it's funny because he just, became transfixed on it <laughs> and his thing was, was that he got into dancing he'd watch michael jackson and he'd, he'd hear a song he was up there and he was doing his thing and i said you know just stick with it and, he, and and the thing is you just never know and i've had the pleasure over the last 15 years to meet people and talk with people that i just never thought i would meet and talk with but yeah. you know as you're getting out there as you said doing your thing you just don't know and i think you know, being prepared, trying to be your best at doing it, knowing, as you said, what your priorities are, that you will be very richly rewarded, and I think in ways that you just don't expect. And that's what makes the whole journey of life exciting, when you follow that soul's desire to as far as you can go and just see what it brings to you. Oh, absolutely. And it, it does multiply. In fact, because I had played with Michael Jackson, that led to me playing with Jeff Beck. You know, that that was a, a dream I never even had because he never even played with another guitar player since the Yardbirds in the 60s when he was in the band with Jimmy Page for a short time. And I was just a fan, and I, I tracked him down only to get an autograph. And when I finally met him, I gave, a, gave him a copy of my first CD that came out and thought, okay, I can check that off the bucket list and I'll probably never see him again. He called maybe a month later and said, I finally had a chance to listen to your CD and let's cut a CD together. You know, there you go. That exploded my gray matter big time. <laughs> Absolutely. Very enjoyable stuff. It's it's great to have you on the program and to share, you know, how your evolution happened, you know, especially in a day and age that it just was so new. And now you've seen that your ripple effects have created a whole cadre of now up-and-coming females that are in there inspired to do the very same thing. And I know, I know that's probably something you didn't expect, did you? Well, you know, I... I probably have never spent a whole lot of time uh, thinking of how I impact people. You know, unless I get an email or somebody specifically says that you inspired me, uh, it's not in my thoughts. <laughs> I mean, it right. kind of is more now because I've gotten enough letters and I, there is a certain awareness there. Um, and, and I do put out energy. When I, when I see a great YouTube video, I'll be sure to comment on it because that, that fires people up to motivates them to take butt even more. Well, it's always nice to know that your work actually inspires others to get their light open and be able to do the same for others, and that ripple effect actually can transform a whole planet into a much better place for a lot of us to live in. Indeed, and we could use that right now. Yeah, absolutely. Jennifer, again, I want to thank you for being on the Beyond 50 radio program. Is there a website people can find out more about your work? Where are you going to be playing next? What's going on there? Sure. All my dates, as soon as they're confirmed on my website, you can either get there with my last name, Batten.com, B-A-T-T-E-N, or the full name will get you to the same place, Jennifer Batten. Very good. Jennifer, thank you so much for being on the program today. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Bye-bye. You bet. We want to thank you, the listeners out there. You can also be inspired by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. Discover what's going on there. Sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter and stay up to date with what's going on in the world and Beyond 50 as well as upcoming programs. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. <laughs>